I think we can definitely all relate to um, what Leanne had said. 2020 was definitely... It was definitely a shock for everybody, right? Like it, it, it just turned everything upside down. And to be fair, for most of us, life was already being shooken up. Life was already upside down. And it just became this way that just seemed like it took away what little bit of hope we had, what little bit of community we had. It was like, it almost seemed like the enemy was winning and dividing us and causing us to just scatter and to say, you know what, I'm going to fight this battle a different way and I'm going to fight it this way. And to be fair, no matter what it is that we believe or where we were or what it is that we stood by, the reality is it seems like all of us were just trying to find ways to fight this battle. And I, and I pray more than anything that we would realize that the way God calls us to do that is different. Um, it's, it's crazy when you, when you look into the same source material, how things will align together. But I wasn't here Tuesday. Pastor Josh puts the service order together. So I wasn't here Tuesday, so I didn't know what they were singing or doing until this morning. And um, when I saw this song on the list, it's kind of crazy because it's, it's exactly what we talked about Friday during Larie's service, about fighting the good battle, the good fight, fighting the right battle in the right way. We're going to talk about it a little bit more today, but today we're going to do that as Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. We've been reading through the prophets, and we're going to continue through. So if you have your Bibles, turn them to Zechariah uh, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. If you don't have them, it's all right. We're going to have it on the screen anyway. Would you rise your feet for just a second while we read the word of the Lord together? Through the prophet, the Lord says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off, and he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God, you may be seated. So it begins with, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, right? Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. So we're supposed to shout in triumph over something. And that's good, right? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to rejoice, make a joyful noise, all of these things. We're supposed to get excited over something. And this prophet is writing, a truth that is true for both the people who just came out of the exile and for us today. Uh, what, what it's going to come down to is this. We, we celebrate Jesus. We celebrate because Jesus has come and he will come again and the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, our king, King Jesus, has revealed has taught and has exemplified by his life and death on the cross that the battle is not won through the violent methods of the sinful and fearful, but through the life-giving, restorative practices of the bride of Christ, the daughter of Zion, that is, the church. So let's go to the passage and see what it says about this triumph, about what it means. It says in the first part, Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So if I'm in exile and I'm reading this, it's telling me that the king is coming. And what does that mean for that people? It's, it might be difficult for us to put ourselves in that position, but I want us to try to Try to imagine that if we can, even if we have to use the pandemic or, or something else to kind of help us understand what it means to come out of an exile, to come out of a place that we didn't want to go to, a place that we were forced into, an entire new way of life away from what we wanted. So for these people coming out of this exile, coming out of Babylon, it means at the very least that they would once again have a king. That they would have their own leader, their own person to look to. And the way it's written, it says, your king is coming to you. It means that this king isn't just a future thing, but that he is 
in their present, right then and there, he's on his way. He's coming. He is already sent. He's already on his way to do this. His arrival is imminent. It means that this king would be coming to them as if from an enemy kingdom, if you will, the way it's presented here, like, like he's coming from battle. But the king coming back to Jerusalem, the king coming back to this place, the way it's, the way it's presented is in a manner of saying that the king is coming back from battle as if it's finished, it's done. We've been waiting, we know the war is going on, but we don't know how it's going, and so we're all sitting there in Jerusalem, if you will, looking over, saying, okay, are we going to continue to be the people of this king, or are we now going to be the people of this nation, right? So maybe in American context, it would be like looking over the walls, wondering, okay, is that going to be an American flag coming over the hills, or is that going to be some kind of a different flag coming over, and now we're going to have to learn a new way of life. So we're looking, anticipating to see who it is that comes, and they look, and it says, let me tell you who is coming. Who is coming is not Babylon. Who is coming is not Canaan. Who is coming is not some other nation. It's not some other thing. Who is coming is your king. He is coming. The battle is finished. And the king that is coming, he is just. He is righteous. And he is victorious through salvation. In other words, the way it's presented is for us to understand this king has come, but it isn't just that he's gone and he's had a bunch of people help him and that he's fought this battle, but, it, but it's, it's stated in such a way to say that this king has saved, redeemed himself, and this king has redeemed his people on his own. He did this thing. Not he and some great army, but he. And this king who did this thing, this wonderful, powerful king, is humble. He doesn't envision himself above others. He doesn't use his power to force other people into submission. In fact, so much so it says that this king is mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. And when a king would come in riding on a donkey, it was meant to teach us that he was, it was meant to say that he was proclaiming a time of peace, that war is over. That now is the time to prepare as a people of peace, a people who would live into this peace. So how might this be good news to a people who are just returning from exile? Who are just returning from having their lives disrupted in a way that means that normal may never be the same again. They're told that they're going to they're going to get back to being free. You can go now. We release you from this bondage that we had you in, right? Go back to your lives. Go back to your normal. Rebuild everything. Do it normal. But in reality, even though they're released, and maybe we can, I know we can kind of empathize with them a little bit, even though they're released to go back to normal, and they're told that everything's going to be fine and they're going to get support, their fear, their experience makes that really hard to believe. And this fear overwhelms them. This fear kind of just drives them in all the different parts of life to step back and say, okay, I'm afraid something bad is happening here. And when I'm afraid, when I'm backed into a corner, it changes. We all do. I have to revert to a different thing because right now it's a matter of survival. I need to protect myself. I need to protect my family. I need to protect my identity. I need to protect my faith. I need to protect my nation. I need to protect whatever it is that I need to protect. But fear begins to become this thing that drives us, and that directs us into enemy. Fear that, that this freedom that they're offering is going to come with strings attached. Fear that if we let our guards down, then another enemy is going to come and take them captive again. Fear that they may never actually be united again, that we're never going to be the same as we were, that we're always going to be divided. And that's just the way it's going to have to be, and we're going to accept that. They have fear of so many things. And so for them, for that people to know that their king has saved himself and his people, and he is already on his way, proclaiming not a time of war, but a time of peace, That, that would truly be a great reason to celebrate and shout in triumph, wouldn't it? To say it really is, it really is done. It really is finished. And we can all say that and we can all agree, yeah, that would be wonderful. And we might even say it is finished as Christians proclaim. It's finished, I'm free, and I'm all that. But we wrestle with that. We struggle with that. 
Because you can tell me it's finished all you want, but that world is scary out there. And for us today, not even being the exiles, for us today, when we read this passage, we even look at it in a, in a little bit of a different perspective, right? Because this prophecy, when we read it, we usually don't read it out of Zechariah. We usually read it out of one of the Gospels. It's, it's the, the, the prophecy that we know as the triumphal entry, and it's the one that we save for Palm Sunday. You're only allowed to preach on that on Palm Sunday because that's what it's for. It's Jesus coming in on, on the donkey, and then they lay all the palms down. And it's an important passage. In fact, it's, it's one of the, the, the things in, in the Scripture that all four of the Gospel writers, all four of them talk about this triumphal entry. It's that important to what Jesus is doing. It's that important to who we are as His followers. And yet, even though it's so important, we tend to save it for that once a year Palm Sunday. And the problem with that Palm Sunday is while we all love it so much, is really what it does is it just leads us to Maundy Thursday, to Good Friday, and then we jump into Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday, and then too often, it's, it's um, what might be better known as let's plan a break from church for a while now because we've gone a lot over Lent. <sighs> Maybe we'll go back in a few months, that Monday. Right? That's, that's the Monday after Easter, isn't it? Oh, we did it. I did a lot. I was involved in Palm Sunday, Holy Week, even went to the Tenebrae service. I'm not going back to church for a while. That, that's kind of what we do. And that's what Palm Sunday becomes for us. It becomes the marker of the end, and it gets lost amongst all of these other things during the Easter season. It gets buried behind all this stuff that's happening. And then it becomes for us really nothing more than palm branches that are symbolizing that Easter's near, we can dress up good, summer's coming, and it's time to get the boat ready for the lake. Let me read the passage out, out of um, the Gospel of Matthew so we can understand it from our perspective. In Matthew 21, beginning in verse 1, it says, When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you're going to find a donkey tied in a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them and, and he will send them immediately. I, I, just, I still get a kick out of this part. Just imagine this. Y'all are following some guy around the wilderness and he's, he's a little bit different. You know that, but you're following him. He turns water into wine and, 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 and he walks on the water and he does all this other stuff. But then he tells you to go on your own Go find a donkey, right, a, a means of carrying. So go find yourself a pickup truck and um, just go ahead and take it. <laughs> Bring it to me. I'm going to need, the, I'm gonna need that pickup truck. <laughs> and if anyone says anything to you, just, just tell them the Lord needs it. I want you all to try that. That's your homework. <laughs> just so you know, I'm kidding. Because if you get arrested for doing this and you call me, I'm going to tell you it's your own fault for going to the hoose guy, right? Um, do not try to steal a vehicle and don't try to tell people, oh, I'm only taking it because the Lord wants me to take it because they're probably going to arrest you. And if you're lucky, they're just going to put you in the nut house, right? Don't, don't be stealing things. But this is what he tells them. Go and take, take it. Just tell them the Lord needs it. And, and they'll send it immediately. So they go. But it says in verse 4, this took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. This took place to fulfill that. So what the prophet spoke, what we just read in Zechariah, is important. It's important to the exiles. But the reason it's in the Gospels, Matthew tells us, he explains this, because this, this is meant to fulfill what was spoken there. And it wasn't meant to fulfill it in a way of saying, it's meant to fulfill that, how are we going to know the Messiah? The Messiah is going to be able to steal trucks and nobody's going to arrest him. Right? That's not what it is. And to be fair, as silly as that sounds, that's about all we usually think of when we think of this passage. He rode on a donkey to fulfill Scripture that he'd ride on a donkey. So what? This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion. In other words, tell the people of God, look, your king is coming to you. Humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. For those who don't know, Jesus is our king. And he, like all kings, 
as a kingdom. But sin has entered the world, and sin has attacked the king's kingdom and the king's people. In fact, sin enslaved the king's people. Sin took away their true identity. Sin filled the people with fear. And then this same sin that did all of these things, this same sin conditioned them to believe that fear and violence are the ultimate weapons that wielded the ultimate power. And sin caused the people to distrust and turn from the king because the people lived in fear. And I'll be honest with you. I live in enough fear that if someone breaks into my house in the middle of the night, I'm not going to begin with, how are you doing? Can I offer you a warm cup of tea? And the reality is we're conditioned and believe, to believe that violence is what is necessary. And it makes sense to us that in fear, I have to respond a certain way because I'm going to protect my people first and foremost. My family first. My people first. My community first. My nation first. And these things make sense to us. And so it's difficult for us to separate that because it sounds good. It helps us. It's worked. We've, we, even if it hasn't worked great, it's kind of worked because we're here today. We feel somewhat safe here today by doing this. But this is the method that sin has caused us to believe. But the king, the king loved the people so much that the king allowed the enemy to strike him with their most powerful and violent weapon of fear and death. See, you all believe that that really is the means of power, that that is the ultimate weapon, that in the end, the one who can kill the most is the most powerful? Bring it. And he allowed them to give it their worst. And after they, they imposed their most powerful, violent weapon of fear and death upon him, the king stood back up because the enemy's most powerful weapon had no power over the king and his life-resurrecting love. King Jesus came to his people not boasting of his great power and might, but humble with regard for others even above himself. And it's not because he didn't have the power to do these things. It's not because he was weak and it was all he could do. He is God. Do we get that? He spoke, and that which didn't even exist leapt into existence just to obey him. He has a power we can't even imagine or make up. The all-powerful God. Chris said, in the end, every knee will bow. In the end, there isn't some great battle where God's going to fight the enemy and almost lose and then come back at at the end with some final blow. In the end, Christ will say, enough, and even the demons will beg. That is all that they can do. He is all-powerful. And he's trying to teach his people that we are conditioned to believe this lie, this delusion, that that's where power comes from. That the way I protect my family is making myself bigger and badder than the enemy. And God says, don't do that because that's stupid. That's weak. The weak destroy. It is the strong who give life. God brings life and he calls us to do the same thing. And so King Jesus didn't ride in on a magnificent horse wielding a giant sword and a shield to tell his people that battle would require such force to be won. Instead, King Jesus came in on a donkey proclaiming peace. Proclaiming that the deception of this redemption, this redemptive violence had no place in the kingdom of God. King Jesus came to his people as a king returning from conquering the enemy to stay with his people and to be their king so that they would no longer live in fear. 
so that we would no longer live in the fear that freedom comes with strings attached. There are no strings attached if you want your freedom with God. It is simply true, real freedom. Fear that if we let our guard down, another enemy will take them captive again. The enemy cannot take you captive again. Let me tell you something. I think that I would, I would put on one heck of a fight to defend my family. I would fight to the death to defend my family. But I'm not stupid enough to think that I can defend my family from everything in this world. I know that I'm not the most powerful person on this planet. And I know that, that our nation is a great nation, but even that isn't the most powerful thing that's ever existed. That even in that, there is a chance that they would fail and my family would be attacked and I would lose what I love. But I know this with absolute certainty, and this is what we need to know. That if I take everything that I love and that I own and I put it into the hands of God, hey, no one's going to snatch it away. Because it is in the hands of the Lord of the all-powerful. That is where it is safe. That is where it's truly protected. That is where it is secure. That is where its identity is found. So I no longer have fear of an enemy taking them captive. Fear that they may never be united again. We are the people of God. Simply coming to God unites us. I love what A.W. Tozer says. A hundred pianos tuned to the same fork cannot help but be tuned to each other. If we would all just gather and worship God, we would already be such a tight community that the world has never known. We would have each other's back. We would support each other. We would be united in a way even the greatest of writers and poets could never imagine. Fear that leads even the righteous to engage in the acts of unrighteousness. We have seen throughout the churches, throughout even those who are not believers. And then the prophet says in verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. And the bow of the war will be cut off and he will speak peace to the nations. And his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The king comes and disarms his people because war and violence had no place in the kingdom of God. And I wonder... How many, how many of the people, how many of us trust the king enough to allow him to disarm us of our violent methods of doing things? How many of us trust the king enough to allow him to disarm us of the ways and the practices that we use to protect ourselves, our pride, our finances, our families, even our identities? Because it's fear and fear alone that keep the people engaged in the acts of the enemy rather than the acts of King Jesus. That's fear. King Jesus has come. And he speaks peace to the nations. He speaks this shalom, this love, this way of life that is more than just an absence of conflict. But it is a way of life where everything is ordered properly where we know exactly who we are and why we exist. Where we reflect his image perfectly back into creation, into our families, into our loved ones. Where we can engage and participate with creation the way God created us to do so. This is the shalom that he speaks to the nations. And his kingdom, his kingdom isn't just some nation in the Middle East. It is all of the earth, all of the world. His kingdom goes from one end of the universe to the other because it is all His. That is the kingdom of God. And we must, every single person on this planet, subject ourselves to King Jesus and live as the kingdom people that He calls us to be. Because if we do not, then we will never know the shalom and we will rob the world around us of the shalom of King Jesus. Here's the thing. We gather here today as citizens of God's kingdom. Amen? 
We gather here to declare that Jesus is king and will always be king. Amen? That Jesus is the king above all kings and that Jesus' kingdom has no end. You see, friends, we celebrate because Jesus has come and he will come again and the kingdom of God is at hand. Our King, King Jesus, has revealed, taught, and exemplified by his life and death on the cross. But the battle is not won through the violent methods of the sinful and the fearful, but through the life-giving, restorative practices of the Bride of Christ, the Daughter of Zion, the Church, you. And that, my friends, is a reason to shout and triumph. To rise your feet. Father, we give you praise and thanks. And I pray that you would encourage us, that you would embolden us to fight the way you have called us to, Lord. To follow our King, the most powerful God, creator of all the universe, our Savior, our creator, to live the life truly as citizens of his kingdom so that the world around us may know our God reigns. May he, they hear us proclaim it, Father, in all that we do, in every breath that we say, from our very knees. We pray this in the name of King Jesus.